Welcome to BIAS, the live panel. So BIAS is a Science Week event which is developed and supported by the RCSI Rotunda Research Department and the HRB Mother and Baby Clinical Trial Network. And it's funded by Science Foundation Ireland. I thank you all for joining us today. So hopefully we'll, people are trickling in and signing on. Um, so all week we've kind of been posting about biases that exist in women's health and really trying to draw attention to that issue and we're sort of finishing our science week event today with a live panel of experts and it's hosted by Alison Curtis who will be with you shortly and um, we've had about 170 to 180 people register today and they're from medical backgrounds layperson backgrounds all sorts of patient advocacy advocacy backgrounds so it should be a really really nice discussion um, if anyone wants to follow along on Twitter, you can tag us at HRB Mum and Baby um, and use the hashtag Bias Women's Health. Um, so if also if anyone has any questions, you can type them in along the side. There should be a question and answers box there. Um, type them in there and we'll hopefully get to them towards the end. So with that, I'll hand over to Alison. Um, so good morning, everyone. Uh, Hello, um, I am Alison Curtis. I am a weekend presenter on Today FM. I am a mum of one. She's nine, but she acts like she's 15. Um, and I had her at the Rotunda and uh, I was treated extremely well there. We did not have a straightforward arrival. Um, and I suppose being asked to be part of this panel today was really interesting in that I am able to kind of reflect back on what my care was like. And uh, I'm really, really delighted that we've got such a, an amazing panel of people that are on uh, with us this morning. And we're talking, of course, about the historical perspectives of how women's health care has, uh, you know, manifested itself in Ireland, but as well how, uh, you know, we can go forward and how improvements can be made as well. Um, so we thought we what we would do is um, introduce all of our panelists and then have everybody uh, take a moment to tell them more about themselves as well as um, what they're going to be talking about today and then we'll come back and do questions. So uh, we have Dr. Laura Kelly who's historian and lecturer. She's uh, based in Glasgow at the moment and she has an incredible background of information to share with us this morning. Um, we have Jean Sutton who's a patient and board member of Endometriosis Asso Association of Ireland. Dr. Michael O'Reilly, endocrinologist and researcher at Beaumont. He's the only dude, so you'll be able to spot him there. Um, Dr. Cleana uh, Lachlan, who is with the National Women's Council of Ireland, who do incredible work. And then Rachel uh, Kenna, Chief Nurse, Nursing Officer and Women's Health Task Force, which I think is something, the task force in particular, is something that will be amazing for all of us to learn more about um, this morning. So we might start with Dr. Uh, Laura Kelly, and she will be able to tell us a little bit more about herself and her areas of expertise. Okay, hi everyone. Um, yeah, so my name is Laura Kelly. Um, I work on the history of women's health. Um, so I'll be talking a little bit about this today. Um, just get my, sorry, get my, Actually, yeah, great. Um, so yeah, you can go on to the next slide, please, Emer. Um, great. So um, this cartoon appeared in the publication PMT: The Unrecognized Illness in 1979, and it really highlights one of the key problems experienced by women with um, women's health issues. And I'm sure and many of you who are here today who've experienced an issue like endometriosis, PMS, miscarriage or menopause have had similar advice at some point. And this is from 1979, but it's still very relevant. Um, so this lack of understanding of women's health um, really has a much longer history. And it's really crucial to look at the history of women's health in order to understand why things are the way they are and how dominant ideas and biases have emerged. Um, so in my next slide, I'm just going to give you an outline um, of what I'll be talking about today. Um, these are the kind of key themes, um, but given the time constraints, if people have questions, I'd be very happy to expand on any of these. Um, and also I'm very happy to get emails or messages on Twitter if people are interested in any of these. Um, so I'll start by talking about um, women's health in the 19th century. Um, so many of you have heard of um, hysteria. Um, so my next slide um, 
just has three images here um, of women in the asylum suffering from women's health conditions. Um, so hysteria was used as a blanket term to cover a range of ailments, which could include fainting, anxiety, um, even things like sexual desire and melancholy. Um, and it was thought to be a disease that affected women primarily and was often linked to sexuality. Um, so women who were thought to be sex too sexually forward, for instance, um, were often classed as hysterical. Um, so these are just images from the asylum in the 1840s. Um, the first woman, Eliza V, um, she was aged 43. She was admitted to Bethlehem Asylum in March 1846. Um, she was said to be suffering from um, hysteria um, and the cause of the uh, illness was said to have been disappointment in love and erroneous views on religious subjects. Um, the second woman um, was aged 23, a domestic servant, um, and again she was admitted because she was said to be labouring under an attack of mania um, as a result of the irregularity in her menstrual functions. Um, the final um, image is of Martha S, aged 20, and the wife of a labourer, um, and she suffered from an acute um, attack of dementia arising from puerperal causes. So this often happened to women after they'd given birth um, or they would experience um, puerperal fever, puerperal psychosis. Um, and really the kind of solution to these issues in the 19th century was to put women in the asylum. So the next slide um, talks a little bit about understandings of women's health in the 19th century. Um, so these were really limited and were heavily influenced by perceptions around a woman's place in society. Um, and you can see this um, quote from Lawson Tate, who was a surgeon at the time. He talks about how you know they really didn't know a huge amount about um, gynecological conditions. Um, to mention also menopause um, in the 19th century, um, women who were suffering or going through menopause um, or suffering uh, from side effects of menopause often experienced a lot of ridicule. Um, and this is kind of stemming for, again from the idea that they'd you know, completed their reproductive cycle, they weren't seen as being valuable within society anymore. Um, so moving then into the 20th century, um, and the next slide shows we, you know, we can perhaps link the lack of research into women's health conditions compared to other conditions um, to the expected function of women, which was really to reproduce and have children. Um, so while there has been lots of research in the 20th century into childbirth, pregnancy and infertility, there's been less medical research which has engaged with women's reproductive health issues that are not directly related to having children. And even today you see with conditions such as endo that many women don't get a diagnosis until they start to try to have children and encounter fertility issues. And again, the first slide I showed earlier, it's kind of this idea that women are expected to put up um, with these conditions. Um, also, I think it's important to mention that um, kind of reduced numbers of women in the medical profession for a lot of the 20th century, I think that really had an important impact um, on the way kind of fields such as obstetrics and gynaecology developed. Um, and more generally, for much of the 20th century, women experiencing conditions such as miscarriage, endo, uh, menopause and PMS have really had to put up with stigma, shame and silences around these conditions. And moreover, in Ireland, I'd really argue that there was even more shame and stigma as a result of the influence of the church. Um, so the next slide is uh, just going to, I'm just going to briefly talk about contraception and family planning. Um, so contraception was illegal in Ireland until 1979. Um, and access, you could get the pill in Ireland as a cycle regulator um, in the era when contraception was illegal, but this again really relied on having a sympathetic uh, GP. So in this period in the 60s and 70s, my research has really showed <clears throat> the importance of women's networks in disseminating information about birth control, but even after legalisation, um, access was quite difficult um, and you do see how class and you know your location really impacts on access. Um, to talk a little bit now about feminist health activism, um, so from the 70s you start to see um, the emergence of feminist groups in Ireland and the next slide just has a few images um, in relation to this. Um, so many of you will know the Irish Women's Liberation Movement and their campaign for contraception, but you've also got groups like Irish Women United who set up the Contraception Action Programme to draw um, attention um, to the issue of contraception in Ireland. You've also got Spare Rib magazine in Britain talking about PMT um, and then the Well Woman um, founded in 1982 in Dublin by Anne Connolly, which really emerged as a kind of women centred approach to women's health. Um, my next slide talks a little bit about self-help. Um, 
So women's health books, um, which kind of arose from the kind of 1950s, they really started to gain popularity. Um, and some of these, such as Katharina Dalton's Once a Month, which is on the next slide, um, provided women with information on their condition, the symptoms and treatment, and but also provided guidance on how women could raise the issue with their medical practitioner. Um, women's magazines also were a really important source of information. Um, the next slide is just an image of some of the charities that have um, been campaigning um, on these issues in the frequent absence of adequate medical care and treatment for women. And these have really been crucial in providing women with information on their condition, empowering them and spreading awareness as well as campaigning. Um, so finally, just to kind of sum up um, with some brief conclusions. Um, so we can see in my final slide, this quote from Gabrielle Jackson. So really there's a persistence of these issues that women are still treated as hysterical, overly emotional and anxious. Um, so not a lot of change from the 19th century. Um, however, there is starting to be more awareness and thanks to the work of charities and grassroots organisations, you see that women's health is starting to be taken more seriously, such as kind of the recent report on endo in the UK and the dull hearing in Ireland. Um, but we really do need to think further about how we can um, further erase stigma, shame and silences, but also thinking about um, how issues such as race, class and gender really impact on women's experiences of these conditions. So thank you and I'll stop there. That's excellent. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Laura. And as we say, we'll come back to questions uh, that people are sending in through the Q&A uh, function here, as well as some that I have for you myself as well. <laughs> um, Jean Sutton, you're a patient and a board member with Endometriosis Association in Ireland. Um, will you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Yeah, so I've got some slides as well. And just um, before we start, I'm not going to get too much into the science of endo. That's online on the endometriosis study and relevant medical sites. But just to let everyone know, the general es accepted estimation is one in 10 women during their reproductive years have it. That's about 176 million women and girls worldwide, which I once heard described as the eighth largest country in the world. But that language also excludes trans and non-binary people and men. So we are improving on inclusive language, I think, globally, but it should be something that we just bear in mind when we're talking about it. But in terms of my own journey, um, if you want to go on to the next slide there, um, I have some quotes there that I've heard um, in my time. Um, I was diagnosed in 2011. I had surgery again last year. I've been fine for a lot of years, but in the past two years, it's been pretty rough with symptoms such as pain and nobody really has any answers for you. Um, you know, they people just assume you're stressed all the time and you're like, no, I'm fine. Like at one time I wasn't working, I was on a career break and the doctor was like, are you stressed? And I'm like, well, I'm great. <laughs> You know, but I've heard a lot of um, weird lines. I've heard some great doctors and actually those first two lines didn't bother me because they were actually dealing with the issue at hand just in a kind of caustic, um, you know, way. But the final two lines, you're not surprised about hearing them. And if you want to go into the next slide, you'll see that Ireland has a history of dismissing women's health concerns. I've listed some of the more um, well-known scandals there. Some of those are terrifyingly recent. And as Laura mentioned, you know, there's a strong case to be made that the Catholic Church is played a big role. But you also have old-fashioned sexism. And I think in recent years, you're looking at bureaucratic shambles. Like there's a case that's emerging, um, a scandal emerging out of Donegal about endometrial cancer at the moment. Um, but I wanted to highlight one particularly awful case, Dr. Neary, which everyone knows from Our Lady of Lourdes, and he's known for having removed wombs of women after birth. But he also carried out dozens of unnecessary ophorectomies, which one BMJ article says were often on the basis of a diagnosis of endo that was little more than a hunch. And then that 2008 report um, by two doctors said that the post-operative examination of the tissue proved the diagnoses were face or false or exaggerated. So he also told women that endometriosis was pre-malignant. So he used control and the term endo, which these women didn't know about, to coerce them and let them know he, he was doing the right thing, which he wasn't. So it's a huge ask to ask Irish women to trust the health service. And on the next slide, I also wanted to address racial bias. This was on the HSE website until 2015, and the science has not said that for a while. The EAI worked to get that removed, and thankfully it is removed at the moment. Um, we also have a lacuna in data around how women, certain women are treated in the Irish health system in terms of endometriosis. And like, you know, traveller women, uh, women of colour, are they seeing a longer diagnostic delay than white women? 
um, also in terms of class. So that's a global issue as well, as you see, that's a quote from an American journal and it's around the world. But however, I am hopeful about the future of endometriosis and just went to the next slide about communication. Um, as a communications professional, I'm seeing lots of positive signs. And one is using fiction to communicate and console women. And in recent years, we've seen um, lots of books emerging. And these are great because they give women the vocabulary for the symptoms. Um, and so if you'll see that, like writing about health and stuff, it isn't new. Um, if you go to the next slide, Jodie B. Cole has been doing it for years, tackling ethical issues. And she has been speaking about the research she does and stuff like that. And just the some books that feature women with endometriosis. I've picked a selection here if you want to go to the next slide. Um, these wouldn't be seen as traditional science communication texts, but in my opinion, like having a sick character whose story the reader follows dismantles the shame and gives people the words and they might recognise their symptoms, like people reading Sally Rooney's book Conversation with Friends might be like, oh, I have similar periods. Um, if you just want then to go on to the next slide, another um, use of communication in recent times. Um, we've seen people talking openly about menstrual health and sometimes endometriosis. We've had the Tampax ad, period poverty. Sean McCreef did a column in the Irish Times recently. And Instagram is a huge um, ground for women to talk about their health and endometriosis. I know that endo um, and access to gynecare is on the agenda of the Women's Health Task Force, but I'll have to do more specific follow up. And we've also seen endo be mentioned in the doll, as Laura mentioned. Um, last year, an endo activist called Amy Brown reached out to her TD um, and we presented alongside her in Leinster House. So all these small actions, they have an echo. And also menstrual health programmes are one thing I see being a big solution to a lot of these issues around bias and diagnostic delay. The recent UK report, which Laura referred to, asked that all four countries include this on the curriculum so that young people recognise the signs and they know when to seek help. It's compulsory in England from 2020, but not UK wide. Um, if you just go to the next slide, uh, I go into a bit more detail about menstrual education. I've done a lot of research into this, so I'd love to see it happen in Ireland. It's just happened in Kenya where there are specific programmes um, addressing endometriosis and other concerns. And they operate in New Zealand and Australia and Australian ha have broadened it to include all pelvic pain conditions and they also include boys in the talks. New Zealand, which at the EA EAI equivalent runs, also target health clinics in the areas when they teach the programme so that everyone in the early diagnostic journey is empowered with similar information and it kind of tackles that bias and dismissal. And another interesting thing, the Australian approach is their assessment is taken into account cultural and social differences, rural, urban, religion. And then Scotland also has digital resources available online and one of them mentions endometriosis. It doesn't go into huge detail, but it is something and it's aimed at teens. So this is an area I've done loads of research in and I'd love to work on it more, get talking to people because I think it's kind of key um, to get there early and to empower women at the knowledge that this is not pain is not normal, what you're feeling is not normal, you deserve healthcare. So that's me. Amazing. Um, that's brilliant, Jean. There's so much in that um, and we'll definitely come back to loads of different things that you've mentioned there. Um, and Dr. Uh, Michael, who's in Beaumont, a specialist as well, he's joining us now. If you want to do an introduction, um, Dr. Michael O'Reilly at the moment, and we'll come back with questions for you as well. Sorry, I'm just checking. You can see my slides there. Yeah. Great. And everyone can hear me. OK, so thank you very much for the invite. Uh, my name is Michael O'Reilly. I'm a, a, an endocrinologist in Beaumont and I have a particular interest in polycystic ovary syndrome, uh, which affects uh, up to 10 percent of women and possibly more. And I've had an interest in kind of gender inequality in, in healthcare. And uh, for many years, my mother was a, a GP in a, a small rural town in Ireland and she used to be frequently asked if uh, she had the same qualifications as my father who was also a GP and she was often asked this but not just by men but by by women as well so uh, this is something that that grated on her so I've probably um, inherited her frustration. So polycystic ovary syndrome why is it important? Well PCOS was typically considered to be a, a reproductive disorder of premenopausal women but increasingly we're recognising that polycystic ovary syndrome is actually a lifelong condition and there are consequences 
to the hormonal disturbances that we see in PCOS from the in utero phase uh, in the womb right through to um, the postmenopausal phase of life. And why is it important? Well, we know that women with polycystic ovary syndrome are at significantly increased risk of cardiometabolic disease. So not just cardiovascular disease, but other uh, metabolic problems such as type 2 diabetes, uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, etc. So the, the incidence rate of type 2 diabetes is at least threefold higher in women with PCOS compared to a woman of the same weight without PCOS. And increasingly we're seeing that there may in fact be um, increased cardiovascular mortality associated with this. There was a large study in the BMJ published just last month where it showed that women with uh, menstrual irregularity, and this is not to create alarm, it's just to, to, to flag it as a health issue, had a significantly increased risk of premature mortality. That's a death below the age of 70. And really menstrual problems are actually a surrogate marker for overall health uh, in, in a woman. So it's, it's not the cycles themselves that conferred the increased risk of, of death. It, it's essentially the uh, surrogate biology that the uh, menstrual cycle represented. I thought it was very interesting that uh, the first consensus guidelines, so these are uh, international evidence-based guidelines in polycystic ovary syndrome. The very first ones were only published two years ago. And this was a, a, the outcome of a, a multi-centre, multi-country collaboration where the evidence was reviewed. And it's incredible that a disorder that affects 10% of all women uh, did not have consensus guidelines on how we should manage this in the clinical context. And actually, the fact that these guidelines are informed by admittedly low to moderate quality evidence speaks volumes for uh, the sort of paucity or lack of research into PCOS over the years. So we receive referral, referrals from primary care uh, from a whole different spectrum uh, of, of, of patients and essentially sometimes they come to us with weight management concerns, sometimes they refer to our uh, gynecology colleagues with uh, menstrual disturbance, infertility. Other times women with PCOS are referred to the dermatologist with cosmetic issues and these include things like unwanted hair growth which we call hirsutism uh, or acne and those latter two skin conditions are a manifestation of excess hormones like testosterone which uh, all women have uh, but actually are significantly increased in polycystic ovary syndrome. And actually the name itself, PCOS, is probably a little bit of a misnomer. This is not an ovarian disorder. This is a disorder of metabolism. It's a disorder of how our uh, body's insulin works and it's a hormonal disturbance. So to simplify it and distill it down to a condition of ovarian abnormality uh, is really to, to misrepresent and misunderstand how complex polycystic ovary syndrome is. There's a group in uh, Monash University in Melbourne, uh, led by Helena Teed, who have done lots of research into polycystic ovary syndrome, not just on the biology and the, the clinical complications behind it, but also some of the associated health inequalities. And what uh, this group have shown is that uh, if you look at the problems that women with polycystic ovary syndrome present with, the majority of them report issues with weight, but actually significant problems with menstrual disturbance, subfertility, unwanted hair growth, etc. And what I thought was very interesting about this paper, which was published a few years ago, is that up to a third of these women reported that it took them over two years to be diagnosed. And at least 35% of them reported that they saw at least three different healthcare professionals before the diagnosis was made. So I thought that was very telling. And actually, there are significant knowledge gaps amongst ourselves as clinicians uh, regarding the diagnosis and management of PCOS. And it's difficult to blame clinicians for this if, if the uh, first international consensus guidelines were only published in 2018, then it's obvious that the uh, care that is afforded to women is suboptimal. And women with PCOS are consistently underwhelmed by the care that they get 
in primary, secondary and uh, indeed tertiary care. So this was a survey based study amongst physicians and what was interesting I thought in this is that 27% of the respondents who were all doctors did not know what diagnostic criteria they used for policy to diagnose PCOS in their patients. Uh, so the most common criteria that we use are the uh, Rotterdam criteria, which are about 17 or 18 years old, uh, but actually almost 30% uh, of patients or great, greater than a quarter uh, of physicians, rather greater than a quarter, uh, were not familiar with any diagnostic criteria. And then when we look at uh, funding that has been allocated to PCOS over the years, we don't have uh, data from Ireland, but uh, the group of Ricardo Aziz, which are, are based in um, Georgia in the US, they looked at NIH funding. So that's the National Institute of Health, which is a huge government funded research funding body in the US. And they looked at funding allocated to various diseases between 2006 and 2015. And what was interesting compared to less common diseases, and this is not a competition, it's not to disparage any of these conditions, but just to highlight that in relatively rare conditions such as rheumatoid arthritis, connective tissue diseases like lupus uh, or indeed TB, the research funding that has been allocated to it is significantly greater than that allocated to polycystic ovary syndrome. So hopefully the tide is turning a little bit. We've had some funding just awarded by the HRB in, uh, in, in January of this year, which is helping us to look at clinical and biochemical markers that can predict uh, the onset of metabolic disease and cardiovascular disease in Irish women with polycystic ovary syndrome. And we won't look just look at it in an Irish context. We'll be looking at this in, a, in an international context as well uh, with our collaborators in, in Birmingham. So this is a multi-center study. So that's all I have to say and uh, I'll be happy to take any questions at the end. Thank you. That's fascinating. And Michael, it's fascinating about your own history with your parents, both, you know, being in the medical profession and how they were treated differently. That's really interesting. We do have questions that have come in uh, for you already, so we'll come back to those. And uh, we encourage everybody who's joined us this morning uh, for this discussion to send in your questions uh, through the Q&A function as well. Um, Dr. Kleena um, Lognan, you are health coordinator with the National Women's Council of Ireland. They do amazing work. Um, it's over to you for the moment. Thanks very much, Alison. So I'm just going to uh, share my slides here. Um, yeah, so I'm going to present um, just moving the conversation a little bit into a new direction, I suppose, around how gender inequality um, intersects with women's mental health. I suppose taking a cue from Laura um, in terms of looking at the history of these issues. Sorry, just going forward. Um, I've just put this book here um, because the title kind of shows how women's mental health has kind of been categorised in maybe a different way to men over history. And I suppose the, the author, Lisa Pinionese, she's not saying that women have been mad, bad and sad over their history. But what she's saying is that women have been categorised and stereotyped in different ways, often when they come forward with mental health concerns. Um, and I suppose, as Laura said, you know, we see throughout history that women's mental health needs are often met in a different way. So this idea of hysteria was all, often a diagnosis that was given to women who needed mental health supports. And even that concept of hysteria was only removed from the diagnostic manual in the 1980s. Um, and we also see, and it's history we see in Ireland as well, is that for women who didn't maybe fit into social norms, who didn't follow the trajectory around marriage and children and so on, Often women in these situations and also interact with class, but find themselves um, potentially incarcerated in what were so-called asylums. So women's experience and how the uh, medical professional and how society has reacted to their mental health, we do see differences um, for women than for men. So I suppose in the Women's Council, what we're trying to do with the women that we work with and the groups um, that are our members is to try and break down the kind of the gender inequality element of mental health and to break the silence around women's mental health. Um, and to do this, I suppose we see three approaches that really help us in that. The first being that we, we really need to consider women's life experiences and how that impacts on women's well-being. We really want to see that women, as has been discussed here already, that women really are the experts around their own health, about what works for them, what will help them, and we need to hear from women directly about that. 
And also that women are a very diverse group. So we need to be intersectional. We need to see how the differences in people's identities, their access to power um, and so on will impact um, the support that they receive and also the care um, that they receive. So when we look um, at women's mental health, taking that more feminist lens, what we would say is that there are inequalities that women are experiencing in, in our society and in all societies that impact um, on their mental health potentially. And, you know, if you think about it in the Irish context, women are still more likely to be in precarious work, to be experiencing low pay. They're more likely to be taking on a lot of informal care responsibilities um, and they're more likely, unfortunately, to be the victim of uh, domestic and sexual abuse. And these are all um, areas of gender inequality that we believe need to be part of the conversation when we talk about women's mental health. Um, and I suppose just some of that, um, what we know about women's mental health in Ireland, we know that uh, women are more likely to experience depression and anxiety than men. We know that women are also more likely to experience um, an eating disorder, that rates of self-harm among women are, are particularly high. Um, so as I said, like when we want to try and address um, and look at how gender inequality impacts on women's mental health, uh, one of the most effective strategies to do that, as I've said, is to really talk to women and to hear what women are saying about their own experiences. So in 2018, the Women's Council launched a report, you can see a copy there, called Out of Silence. And we did this with the support of the HSE. And what we did in this report was we spoke to more than 100 women across the country and we asked them to tell us about their own experiences of mental health, what was helping them to keep well, what they felt were gaps in the supports. Um, and as you'll see on the, some of the quotes I've listed here, when women talked about their mental health, they often went directly to those kind of life experiences and inequalities in their own lives. So women talked about all these pressures on them. So there was pressures um, to, you know, to look good, to achieve and work, to care for their families um, and to support their partners and their own families through hard times. And that these were things that really were impacting on how women were seeking support and the type of mental health support they needed. Um, and women also talked about how sometimes when they interacted with mental health services, there wasn't an emphasis on their experiences. So experiences of trauma, experiences of violence and so on, which they knew were having an impact on how their mental health was. But it wasn't necessarily being taken into account as, as part of the care they received. So if you wouldn't mind moving on there, Emer, please. Um, so I suppose responding to what women told us um, and what we could understand from what they were saying about how gender inequality and gender roles were impacting their well-being. In the Women's Council, we've been running um, digital campaigns around women's mental health. And this is just an example of one um, when we're really trying to get to that point. So the, the, the tagline of this campaign is women's inequality should come with a mental health warning. And if you wouldn't mind going on to the next slide there, Emer. So, you know, in this campaign, we were trying to draw out those particular issues that are impacting on women's mental health. And this is just one example here, but it shows how women have taken on conceptions around body ideals um, and uh, the beauty myth, for example, and how that can impact on how women feel about themselves and how they um, maybe present um, in certain ways around their own well-being. If you wouldn't mind moving on again, Emer. Um, and I thought, it, you know, no uh, presentation at the moment really uh, can avoid the topic of COVID. But I suppose what we saw around COVID is how an event like this can actually exacerbate gender inequalities and can therefore also potentially have an impact on women's mental health. So before the pandemic, we know in Ireland there are persistent um, gender inequalities around informal care. So care for children, care for older relatives, and that in general, women are providing the um, the dominant source of this of this care, like the ESRI um, had found in a study before the pandemic that women spend double the amount of time that men do on caring and that women also spend twice as much time on housework. Um, and we were interested in the Women's Council because women were telling us they were having particular difficulties during the lockdown. We wanted to understand women's experience of providing care during the, the lockdown. So we conducted a survey in May of, of this year and women, um, 1,400 women responded to us. And what those women were saying was that there had been an increase in the care that they were providing and that there also had been a, um, a reduction in the time that they had to look after their own mental health and well-being. And just in the next slide there, Emer, please. Um, I suppose I just wanted 
uh, the report is available on our website and it, it details what women ha are saying about their experience of providing care, how stressed and overwhelmed many women felt. But just on this slide, I've just given you some of the quotes that women talked about how before the pandemic, they were just about managing with this um, their care responsibilities. But that the pandemic, the lockdown, the removal of formal and informal care supports they relied on in their lives had really left many women feeling very stressed and anxious. And you can see here women kind of talk about reaching a tipping point uh, during the last lockdown. And you might just move on to the next slide there, Emer, please. And again, just wanted to show some quotes just showing kind of different perspectives that women gave us through the survey. But I suppose what we're saying that we need to collect this information about women's specific experiences. We need to understand what's impacting on women's mental health and well-being. And that from this information, then I suppose we can build up the supports um, and ways of accessing services that would really work with the lives that women are living in Ireland. So thanks very much and thanks Emer for that <laughs> support. That's no excellent. Problem. Thanks Kleena. There's so much in that and actually questions are coming in for you as well of course now so we will go back to to those um and thank you to everybody who is sending in the questions as well last but certainly not least uh, rachel kenna chief nursing officer women's health task force the task force is fascinating to me i have to be honest and say that it was a relatively new information to me you know that it is in existence and what it can achieve um so we're going to pass it over to rachel now Thank you very much, Alison. Delighted to be here this morning on behalf of the Women's Health Task Force in the Department of Health. Um, you might just move to the next slide, please, Emer. Just by way of starting, um, just to, to give some information about the Department of Health in the sense that women's health is a priority. Um, not only do we know that women have specific health needs and that indeed their health outcomes and experiences are affected by their roles in the family and society and their wider circumstances, but it is a priority for this government and it was very strongly supported in the budget of 2021. Um, there was a fund of 12 million to ensure renewed impetus of the implementation for the National Maternity Strategy, um, a new model of maternity care, and also to improve gynaecology services. There was also 10 million fund allocated to improved and strengthening screening services, including breast check and cervical check. Um, and then building on the work of the Women's Health Task Force, there was a 5 million allocation of funds to improve women's, to help us to continue to improve women's health outcomes and experiences of health care. Um, and there is a full evidence base on women's health available on the Women's Health Task Force web, uh, web page, which I'll ensure that you get the details of later on. Next slide, please. This slide is just to show you of some of the significant work that is underway from a policy perspective. Um, and then just to kind of lead us into the work of the Women's Health Task Force, which commenced in September 2019. Um, it was established in the Department of Health with the aim of improving health outcomes and experiences of healthcare for women and girls. Next slide, please. So I'm here this morning to talk mainly about the uh, research to date from the radical listening exercise. Um, next slide, please. So the, the radical listening exercise is telling us how um, the task force is listening to women and you've probably picked up in some of the previous presentations that this is a really important factor in terms of um, getting to the, the root of, of the issues in, uh, specific to women's health. So in addition to the extensive consultation and comprehensive consultation of over a thousand individuals and organisations, um, this exercise is now underway. Um, its aim is to enable women across the country share their views and experiences of the health sector um, and the health services. Um, and it is intended, of course, to maximise participation of women across all life stages from 18 upwards. Um, it includes minority groups and disadvantaged women as well. So the sample was to try and capture perspectives from all women, all ranges across the, the country to inform us. Um, it's a three stage process. So just very briefly then, um, stage one, was the social media analysis and this began in uh, July 2019 and ran until July 2020 um, and it is going to it, the analysis began with over 100 million tweets sent in Ireland um, where women were talking about kind of health publicly online, uh, talking about conditions they had themselves, experiences of friends and family, etc. Shared experiences as patients and share where stories were shared. And this has been filtered into over 50,000 um, 
tweets and social media messages relating to women's health in Ireland for us to be able to get um, an analysis. So then the next uh, part of this exercise was the radical listening exercise, which was interviews were, that were conducted with 48 women who represented a range of experiences um, and helped us to hear directly from the women through interviews. Um, the, there was ethnically Irish women, there was migrant women, there was marginalised women, non-Irish ethnic group women uh, from different social grades across the country, um, urban and rural settings um, and across a range of age demographics from 80 to, to 18 to 80 years of age. So next slide please. So what have we heard so far from this research? Um, there's three core truths that are here displayed on this slide. Um, so women's health is complex um, and we need to prioritise uh, the needs and priorities sorry, vary significantly across the life stages. Um, we also have heard that there is regional and socioeconomic status impacts on women's experiences, expectations and needs from healthcare. So there's a lot of variety in that. And we've also heard that chronic illness and disease are a high priority concern for women. Next slide, please. The research has shown us that we have identified six challenging factors uh, which shape women's experiences and expectations of healthcare. And despite huge variation in demographics and the socioeconomic status across the regions of the women that were interviewed, um, these themes, these six themes existed across all the areas. So it's important information to share. In relation to factor one, social and cultural taboo, limited information and conversation, what this was telling us is that women feel unsupported in their health journey and believe that they uh, must be self-reliant um, and take their own control and do the work in inverted commas to ensure that they get positive health outcomes. Uh, one sample just to, to kind of show you what women were saying was from a woman, um, she was based in Dublin in her 20s um, and she said on a visit to her GP, that he was around my own age, the doctor, um, so he wasn't old at all, and he averted his eyes when he asked me when my last period was. Uh, the second factor there is that women felt that they're not treated as individual. And then just again, some sample of, of what we were finding is that women believe their health experiences are unique and that they also feel that they are not looked at as individuals and rather care and interventions are overly generalised, um, leading them to feeling unheard within their healthcare experiences. The third factor that, that um, came across as a recurring theme was that the health system is out of date and out of touch. Um, and women feel that aspects of healthcare system remain patriarchal and that they are not female centric. Um, women are concerned that is a, there is a disinterest in women's health. Um, and this means that the best in class thinking and practice is absent from their care. Um, just again, some samples of, of the interviews that, that women said. Uh, a woman who was based in Cork in the 35 to 45 age bracket said, I feel we're not prioritised enough. I know they're all about mental health now, but I just think it's not good enough. For example, the rooms when you're having scans and things are gone wrong. Find a room. I don't care if it takes two staff to find a room because it's just not good enough. Another example that sticks uh, in, in my mind when uh, we were looking at the research was um, a woman from rural Cork, uh, the 56 to 65 age bracket said, I would have high expectations. I think we are entitled to many things and I want to stay healthy. I want to stay as active as I can. And I want to do whatever I need to do or can to make this happen. You know, I don't see it as a privilege, but I see it as a right. And we have the right to stay healthy with information, with knowledge and services to make that happen. And I don't see that as a luxury. It's a very strong message there. The fourth theme then that came across to us was that uh, women, women carry uh, the greater burden. So women believe that being a woman is physically, emotionally and financially demanding. And also the COVID-19 has brought additional pressures to many households which are falling on the shoulders of many women. Another example then of the real uh, kind of tangible feedback from a woman based in Sligo in the 35 to 45 age group was, um, I mean, it's expensive. I definitely was paying more than a man in the same age as me because I was going to the doctor so frequently and that's not fair. 
You would hate to think that somebody wouldn't have the money to go and get the contraceptive pill or would end up having a baby because they couldn't afford the pill. It's fairly shocking stuff in 2020 and it's just not good enough. The fourth factor then was marginalised groups. Uh, women in marginalised groups perceive that healthcare system is about processes that care that above the care of the individual. They feel that they were viewed negatively by the healthcare system. That is a bureaucratic machine. And the sixth um, theme then that came across was um, that there is a lot of learnings from good care and we need to pay attention to this. And many women shared positive stories of healthcare where they where they really did feel cared for, looked after, and it led to really positive health outcomes. So there is some good stuff out there um, that we felt as well. So next slide, please. So what's next? So the third phase of our uh, work stage three is sharing what we were found beginning today with the information that I'm sharing with you. And then we need to move out and share the results with colleagues and inform our approach to policy development in light of this really important research um, and fantastic information that we have got. So the next plan is that we're going to have a series of town halls which aims uh, to reach out to more of the women across Ireland and expand this discussion. And then Budget 2021, as I've already acknowledged, provides for the establishment of a Women's Health Fund and take forward the priority actions from the Women's Health Task Force, which is really, really exciting. And these will be informed by this radical uh, listening exercise. And then I think there's a short video then just to show how you can contribute um, to this important work and explaining the next steps. I think it's on the next slide, Emer. That's great. And then just the final slide is that we'd love to hear from you today. And this is just how you can get involved. So www.menti.com um, just disappeared off my screen there, but we will make sure that you that you get it back up so that you can contribute. Um, and there is a code that you put in once you log on to Menti. There we go. Uh, 6003460. Um, and just if you could tell us one thing that you think the Women's Health Task Force should work on on year two is, that would be fantastic. Thank you very much. Very happy to take any questions on the work to date. Rachel, that's fascinating. And as I say, I, I I plead ignorance on knowing that it was in existence until very recently. And I think that it's remarkable that it is. And it is, as you say, when you're reading out those comments, it's really striking. And I think of actually a lot of conversations that I've had with friends of mine in dealing with talking about mental health and physical health and how women are treated in the health force in Ireland. But it's also encouraging to know that you guys are in existence and that there's a plan. It's amazing. Um, if you're just joining us, I'm Alison Curtis from Today FM, and we are talking about biases in women's healthcare in Ireland. And we've had some great questions coming in. If you use the Q&A function on uh, Microsoft Teams here, it's excellent. If Dr. Laura is present still, she was the first speaker this morning. And uh, there was questions in for Laura that I actually had as well. And one in particular was wondering if there was a particular turning point in women's history in Ireland, whereby from a medical point of view, women were being better listened to and, you know, to put it very crudely, taken more seriously. And I know that Dr. Laura spoken in the past about how there were uh, marked improvements in, in midwifery in the 1920s. Uh, they decided, you know, in the 1940s, developments there that perhaps could benefit women during child um, labor and birth and that there was you know a look to increasing women's participation within the medical force in the 1950s in Ireland so if she could talk to us more about that that would be great is there a, was there a point in Irish history where it turned for the betterment for women Dr Laura yeah great um thanks Alison so um you know obviously 
there were high um, maternal mortality rates, um, you know, in the early 20th century. So childbirth was a huge risk for women in that period. So um, you see like quite a lot of attention to childbirth and saving, you know, women's lives in this area um, from the 1920s. And really there's lots of improvements in prenatal care, um, midwifery, hospital care. Um, you've also got the establishment of St. Alton's Hospital in 1919, which was founded by Kathleen Lynn, um, a female doctor and uh, Madeleine French Mullen. And I think that was really important in, um, you know, shifting the conversation um, back to, to women's health. Well, with regard to um, childbirth, um, However, it's not really till the 50s that maternal mortality rates start to drop considerably. And I think there's still really a focus on, you know, mothers and childbirth and pediatric care. Um, so I think women's health condi conditions like the ones we've been discussing today really took a, a back seat. You know, they were seen as less important. And I don't think there was a lot of attention drawn to them until really the 70s um, when you've got kind of femi feminist um campaigners who are really kind of starting to draw attention to these issues um, and the impact that they have on, on women's health and the kind of disparities and inequalities. Um, but it, again, I think it's not really then till the 80s and 90s with the work of um, activists and charities that, you know, there's more awareness around these conditions. And I think, you know, as a lot of the speakers were, were saying in their talks today, it's, it's obviously still, you know, a really um, contemporary issue. You know, women, a lot of women still aren't taken seriously when they go to their doctors. Um, so I think things are starting to change, but I think there's still a lot more work that needs to be done on this issue. And Dr. Laura, if I could ask you as well, and you sp I watched one of your talks earlier, um, just about the significance of encouraging more women to be within the medical profession. How significant is that in the outcome of women's health care? Yeah, I think that's really important. Um, so obviously it's only kind of in recent years that you see start to see equal numbers of women um, coming into Irish medical schools. Um, but I think the problem um, remains that women still aren't going into kind of positions of leadership. Um, they also find it hard to, you know, um, you know, per pursue certain fields of medicine. So obs and gynae, for instance, um, has been largely male dominated. Um, it's difficult for women to kind of um, have a career in surgery sometimes if they want to kind of combine uh, family life with, with their um, medical career. So like if you look at kind of early doctors in Ireland, women doctors, they would have tended to veer into general practice um, in the past. Um, so I think, again, this is starting to change, um, but I think this really has had a big impact, um, you know, on the kind of urgency of, of women's health um, as an issue. Um, yeah, so I think that's that's really important as well. It is. And if I could say something on a personal note, I actually would have a bias in reverse in that I have always sought out female GPs in female care. Um, so perhaps that's something I need to actually look at myself as well. Um, Jean, if I could come to you next. Jean Sutton from Endometriosis Association of Ireland. Something you said in your introduction that really struck with me is how are women supposed to build trust with their carers within the medical profession? And I find that an interesting concept as in how we as patients approach our medical care, our people giving us medical care. How do we build trust? Well, I think GPs and doctors and consultants by engaging with women's groups. Um, we have an Endo Information Day every year. We've had consultants over to it. Um, we've had scientists who are working on Endo speak at it. Andrew Horn in Edinburgh, for instance, who's working on a non-hormonal drug treatment. Um, so I think by engaging with us and also, you know, sometimes like, you know, you, doctors have to learn a lot, their education, it's all expansive. You might have forgotten about endo, you know, so re, like, you know, get to know it again. Um, look at our, like we publish um, information um, leaflets, if you put them in your GP clinic, um, reading the stories of women with endometriosis as well and putting like a human face to those stories as well, um, because, you know, you can look at the, the symptoms and all that, but you might realise like, you know, the financial costs of this on somebody like people have left jobs, um, you know, managers haven't been understanding. Like I, people ask me, how am I finding working from home? And I'm like, a somewhat chronic illness, it's a godsend. 
um, I feel amazing. Uh, so that's great. Um, but also the UK report, which we've all referred, a few of us have referred to about the end of thing that came out last month. And in that they referenced that the NICE guide, the NICE guide, which is like a pathway for doctors to consult with and it, you know, what symptoms, when you should send somebody to um, the consultant, etc. what tests, that hasn't been fully implemented as far as I know in the UK. So they uh, report calls and that to be fully implemented. But Ireland, I know, has adapted one or two NICE guides here for other chronic illnesses. So something like that and engaging with doctors like, you know, it's not too late, late for us all to fix this and for the next generation of women. And some women don't know they have endo as well until they're in their 30s, 40s, 50s. You know, they've, they've been used to what's happening or the symptoms haven't flared up. So I do think, um, as Rachel referred to, you know, having these conversations when, on the slide, the number one thing that she put up there, we just need to keep talking about it. And we're really lucky the media um, have been seeking us out more and more in recent years. Unfortunately, sometimes they get defini definition of endo wrong, but everyone's trying. We contact them like little school marms to correct it. Like last night, I emailed the Irish Times about a heading and they corrected it this morning. So, Very good. Uh, Very good. yeah. Jean, can I ask you another question came in from someone who's joined us here. What, in your opinion, is the most urgent thing we need to do to fix issues, I suppose, around, and I mean, you have answered this in part now, but around yeah. Period education as well, because I know with I have a nine year old daughter, she's very uh, aware of what happens to me every month. And we've talked quite a bit about that, but maybe that's not the same case in a lot of households, like about period education and when we should start that with our, our with our children, sons as well. Yeah, and I think it's not just period education because, you know, explaining the cycle to someone, we get that in biology anyway, even if your school isn't on top of it or has an ethos that doesn't want to talk about that, you'll learn that in the classroom. But it's learning about the menstrual disorders um, so that, you know, you have these red signs, these, like, you know, you know when to go to the doctor. You can say to your mom, listen, we learned about this thing in school today. You know the way I can't do sports once a week every month or I can't meet my friends. I've had to cancel this because that's how I kind of copped out endo. I looked at my diary and I was floored once a month, once a week, every month. So it's teaching people that. And also, I think by teaching boys and girls is you're being potentially trans inclusive and all this, but you're also teaching empathy. And those boys might spot that symptom in their sister. And like I've had guys contact me on Instagram and Twitter, sliding into my DMs to talk about endo. And I don't mind it, like about their girlfriends, about their moms, their sisters, and I've recommended books to them. So I think it's teaching people the warning signs. Like we teach people um, the warning signs of stroke. Let's teach them the warning signs of menstrual disorders and be include not just endo, PCOS um, and a lot of other conditions like that. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Jean. That's brilliant. Um, Michael, a good few questions have come in for you as well. Um, one of the ones that struck me, though, that came in uh, yesterday was actually, why do we think that so many common ailments in women are misdiagnosed still to this day or potentially worse, even just ignored? We just need your mic again, Michael, sorry. OK, sorry. Um, I think it comes back to historical things. Um, I think sometimes there's a, at least in the old days, this patriarchal um, attitude from, you know, typically male doctors over the years who sort of, uh, you know, talk down to women. And I, and I think it's only now slowly starting to change. So, you know, I, I can really only comment in my own area of interest, but certainly for polycystic ovary syndrome, this was, you know, seen typically as a disorder of women who were overweight with excess hair. And, you know, when it's sold like that, that's not going to be attractive to, to you know, to researchers, to academics, to clinicians to learn more about it. It's actually for something that affects 10% of women, it's unbelievably complex. We still don't know the underlying etiology and um, as I've shown in the slides, hopefully it's been consistently underfunded and it has just been portrayed as a disorder of the reproductive years when actually the health consequences go far beyond that. And we talked a little bit about menstrual health and, and menstrual regularity. It's often a surrogate for underlying health problems. And, and this study that uh, I, I spoke to you about that was published in the BMJ last month where there was a signal for 
premature mortality. I mean, that should be a big warning sign for clinicians. So, you know, I, I'll bring, or I'll go around with my trainees on a post take uh, a, a ward round where we admit patients through A and E. They'll have no problem telling me that the patient has, you know, a flight of stairs in their house or a downstairs bedroom. None of them ever, and I'm trying to change this a little bit, will discuss what a, a woman's menstrual cycle was like, either in her reproductive years or in the postmenopausal phase. I'm trying to press home that that's a really good marker for overall health and for the risk of future health complications. So small things like that can be sufficient. Also, Michael, something that came in a couple of times was that historically heart, and this is connected, but like historically heart um, health issues are thought to be a male health issue and that perhaps when it comes to women who are having cardiac difficulties or emergencies, it's not spotted maybe necessarily as quickly because it's assumed that women or historically or whatever way we've looked at it, that women don't actually tend to suffer from cardiac issues as much. Yeah, I think it's consistently underplayed. I, I think with Western lifestyles, that sort of disparity between cardiovascular disease between men and women has, has narrowed recently. And, you know, in, in the postmenopausal phase, it shows how important our sex hormones are in mediating our risk of cardiovascular disease. So the, the risk of cardiovascular disease in postmenopausal does start to approximate that of a man after a few years. So there's probably a protective effect of, of estrogen that we don't fully understand. But equally, if you look at women with polycystic ovary syndrome, they have a two to three fold increased risk of cardiovascular disease. And, and we're not sure exactly what mediates it. It might be a phenomenon called insulin resistance where our, our body's insulin doesn't work as well. And that's associated with, with vascular abnormalities. It might be these hormones called androgens like testosterone exerting effects on the, the vasculature wall and things like that. So there's a huge amount we don't understand, but cardiovascular disease in young women is becoming more of a problem. There's no doubt about that. Thank you very much, um, Michael. If I could actually bounce back to Rachel and Rachel, there's a good few questions just coming in about um, you know, getting in touch with you guys, the Women's tax Task Force, what you would like people to do in year two. It's menti.com. And um, just how long is it open for and how long can people make their suggestions for? Um, so so the, there's, if anybody wants to take part, there's a number of ways that, that you can actually do it. Um, so if you go onto the website, the Women's Health Task Force website, there, there's um, information there on how you can actually take part. And then the menti.com, um, uh, I'm not sure, I have a colleague online who might be able to tell me how long that is open for, but certainly I think we are um, open to any. Anna, I don't know if you're able to, to kind of put up how long the menti is open for. That's okay, we can come back to that as well. Um, and actually, Rachel, I'll come back to you in two seconds because there's a yeah. couple of questions as well. Sure. Kleena, if I could ask you, um, obviously the National Women's Council of Ireland, you do such amazing work and I, I would hope that people have a good awareness of you guys, but you know, your specific area of interest is, you know, and us talking and discussing how COVID, I find that interesting and I've seen that come up in different newspaper articles and different people discussed on different radio shows, but how going forward do you think that we can help women better cope with the, the pressures of COVID and why women are actually, and you touched on this, I know, and maybe perhaps experiencing it at a more heightened level than than male males are? Um, well, I suppose the thing with the pandemic, unfortunately, is that it shows up the vulnerabilities that are already there. I think that's what we're learning as a society overall. Um, so vulnerabilities in our economic system, vulnerabilities in our health system, and then those gender inequality vulnerabilities come really strongly to the fore uh, during the pandemic. And that's been shown, you know, in, you know, in pandemics in the past and in other regions of the world. Um, and I suppose what we were wanting to investigate, as you said, was when we look at these gender inequalities around caring in particular and how much women already are kind of filling in for what you know we think should be formal public care supports like home care for example public and affordable child care so before the pandemic women were filling in for a lot of that um care supports and then as you know those were removed during the lockdown in particular the burden really did fall on women um, and I, so i suppose 
you know, as with all things to do with gender inequality, it's a big task to address it. It's partially about um, us as a society thinking about why are why do we think about care and care work as maybe a more feminized role? Um, and we're, you know, we need to ask men to be able to step into that care because care is very fulfilling as well. And, you know, it's something that we want to do for our loved ones, but we need to do it in a supportive way. And otherwise it can, as I think our survey has shown and other reports have always shown, the care can then really impact on your well-being if, 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 if it becomes too much or if it's unsupported. But like in the Women's Council, we are certainly calling on government to look at care now. COVID has really exposed the issues that we have. So we need to be providing universal social care so that, you know, all the family carers around the country are supported in that work. We need universal mental health services and mental health services, I suppose, out into the community. I think um, when we spoke to women, as I said, for Out of Silence, women talked a lot about how difficult it can be to access mental health services when you have childcare and caring responsibilities, for example. And women talked a lot about wanting access to talk, talk therapy, to counselling in the community. Um, and at the moment, those services are predominantly private and you have to pay for them. And that causes a lot of difficulty um, for women. And I suppose the other thing I think that we're talking about more as a society and the pandemic is part of it, but we were doing it before, is the whole issue of trauma. Um, and when you look at mental health in terms of trauma, it can be helpful um, in terms of thinking about, you know, the social determinants. So what are the determinants? What are the life experiences that have impacted women's mental health? Because we need to really address those rather than perhaps these diagnoses that have been given to women in the past that were very stigmatizing but didn't lead to the kind of support and ongoing care that women need. And I think there is a move within um, the new national mental health policy that government have launched to look at trauma informed care. And I, you know, the really good way that this has been explained to me, because I'm not a medic, but is instead of asking, you know, a person what's wrong with you, you ask what's happened to you. And by asking about what's happened to somebody, you can then think about all the different impacts on their life and all the different supports they'll need. Um, so that was a long way of, of saying that we need to end sexism, but um, there, there are smaller things we can do along the way. Um, it's really interesting to hear from everybody today. It really is fascinating. And it just if I could do a quick side note, it really it reminded me of when I first moved to Ireland in 1999 and I did go into a GP's office and I said, you know, I'm just here for a checkup. And they're like, well, what's your particular concern? And I was like, nothing. I just uh, want to make sure there's nothing wrong. And they're like, yeah, but what are you actually really concerned about? And it was a very roundabout conversation whereby I guess I, I didn't use the word physical because in North America, well, in Canada, certainly it would be just common from early age as a child all the way through that you go once a year, you have your blood work done, you have everything done. So it's a, it's a, a seismic shift, I think, to for both men and women in Ireland to think of preventative health care as, as opposed to just uh, once something has happened to them. And I think uh, that ties in with, you know, having the confidence to go into the professional that is a doctor sitting in front of you and explain. And that's difficult for a lot of people to do, to explain what it is that they're, you know, concerned about. Rachel, if I could bounce back to you now. Um, with the Women's um, Health Task Force, a couple of questions came in about, you know, how maternity care is going to be targeted in particular. And one thing in particular and come in, came in a few times is just how are we going to support women in general more when it comes to breastfeeding as, as something that they would require support for? OK, that's that's a great question. Alison, and just to go back to the previous question, Menti will be open for one more week just um, for, for detail in relation to that. Um, in relation to maternity um, services and supporting ongoing care, particularly breastfeeding, um, an area of, of keen interest of mine as a nurse, as well as, as um, the Women's Health Task Force. So as I mentioned in my presentation, the budget for 2021 has delivered strongly on the commitment to um, women's health, including 12 million specifically allocated for maternity services. Um, this funding will build on capacity for maternity services, um, including workforce, so skill mix across workforce. So introducing all the kind of supportive roles that are going to be needed to ensure that women have better access to maternity services for uh, the wider range of care needs that are associated with it. 
Um, and this will also help us to be able to develop community-based midwifery services um, because we are hearing from women that that's a, a really key key development in terms of provision of well-rounded maternity care um, and having choice. Women want choice for the types of care that, that they feel that they need and obviously that's a very individual experience so that's an important part of the development um, and also this will help us then to enhance postnatal care and early transfer home services and we know that when we are expanding those that particularly women need support with um, breastfeeding um, it's well documented the importance of breastfeeding but it's also well known how difficult and challenging it can be um, and there's a lot of supports um, that are out there and we just need to uh, get them I suppose wider distributed through the maternity strategy and make sure that that is implemented and thankfully now we have the money to do that um, and also then we have a uh, support the ongoing implementation of support through the maternal and newborn clinical management system program so that's a big program of work that we need to to support is that um, in addition to this then as well the task force members include maternity and gynecology unit within the department which is working on the strategy and also then the national women and infants Chil um, program uh, who's who lead the management organization and delivery of maternity gynecology and neonatal services so a very important uh, component to the women's health task force as well. Uh, priorities for 2021 are still being decided but we welcome public input as I've said a number of times to what the task force should focus on. So with the responses given by the attendees of this event to the Mentimeter it's going to inform the next year so uh, feel free to put breastfeeding on that and we will make sure that it's prioritised. And actually Rachel as well something just came in as well is there going to be a focus on crisis pregnancy supports in the task force as well? Again, yes, that is something that is detailed in the maternity strategy. So yes, we will be focusing on um, all of those uh, particularly challenging areas for women. Perfect, perfect. Um, thank you. And then I have another one for Michael. Um, Michael, you you show clearly that there is a mixed referral pathway, and I think that that is a concern for all elements of healthcare, mental and physical healthcare, um, for women's health conditions, including PMDD and endo. Do you think that there is a way that a more of a uniform approach can be made and a clearer pathway for referrals for women who have those health concerns? Yeah, I think it would be very useful if, if something like that could be implemented because um, people seeing three healthcare professionals before they get a diagnosis is, is pretty unsatisfactory. I think everybody would agree. Um, in my previous consultant post in Birmingham, we kind of did exactly that. So we sent, we tried to impress on the GPs to send all the referrals to us regardless. So whether it was fertility, hirsutism, acne, etc. We saw that we triage the referrals and then we Sometimes we, we saw the patients ourselves, but very often then we would kind of streamline them down the most appropriate um, referral route. And, and that seemed to increase patient satisfaction. So we're a bit away from doing that in Ireland just yet, but um, I, I hope that we could do something similar. And I, I hope that PCOS will be on the radar of the Women's Health Task Force as well in the years to come, because it doesn't sit nicely in the maternity and gynecology fields it's 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 kind of its own area um, and and hopefully uh, it's not going to be left behind so i'll be lobbying for that for my for my patients as well he's putting pressure on you there rachel <laughs> um laura can i bounce back to you as well you know you discussed in previous um you know lectures just about and I think of this in particular as well, I suppose it's my age group, but how many of my close friends and colleagues have had miscarriages and yet the discussion around it is still so uh, cloaked. Obviously, it's, it should be up to the individual on how they want to you know, discuss it with other people in their own lives. But do you envision a time where we will be able to discuss it more openly or is that in part and parcel with the fact that we need to have you know get rid of the stigma to, around it and encourage women that you know it's something that they can discuss openly if they want to yeah definitely and yeah like you Alison I mean I yeah know lots of people who have had this experience and um yeah it I think it just makes the loss so much uh more traumatic when there is this kind of silence around it that people can't can't really talk about it and i guess because um miscarriage is so common in the kind of 
earlier period in pregnancy as well before people can you know get past 12 weeks and they you know can share the information with friends and family um i think that kind of compounds things as well um so i think i would kind of agree with some of the points made by by jean earlier i think um we need to engage more with um, women's health charities who are really you know the ones who are kind of experts in this area they've been actively listening to women's experiences for years um such as i mean there's a miscarriage association um and you know in the uk um there's lots of other groups that that um deal with this issue but i think women's voices are key really to all of this and listening to women um and providing that kind of space that this is a a really common thing um that happens to women like some of the other conditions we've talked about um like endo is one in 10 women um pmdd is thought to affect one in 20 women um so again i think it, that that's really important is just giving women that like, opportunity um to to speak about these issues and share their experiences so that's why the work of the women's health um, task force is really important um giving women that space um so i think hopefully that will help to kind of um, make women more comfortable in talking about, about these issues. Um, but obviously women do talk about them amongst themselves as well. As well. Um, I mean, if you look at like the history of contraception in Ireland as well, you know, as I said, women's networks were so important for kind of, you know, finding out about, well, which GP is going to be um, sympathetic and give me the, the pill when it's illegal, things like that. So I think that's, that's really crucial too. Amazing, thank you. Um, and actually just some comments um, related to Jean. I'm glad that's a positive message that the headline was corrected. It's important for patients to be involved in research uh, as well. Uh, there's a need for greater overall recognition of the importance of wellness checks and that a GP is discussing obviously uh, the full the full picture, which is your mental and your physical well-being. Um, I feel that that is getting a little bit better. Hopefully that is. Maybe that's the practice that I attend, but I do feel that it's being brought in um, discussion when you go in for your checkups that, you know, how are you feeling physically as well as mentally as well. Um, has the issue of school nurses been raised in women's task force? I think that they're potentially underutilized, um, and especially when it comes to assisting secondary and primary school students in sexual health education. Rachel, sorry, we're putting a bit of pressure on you, coming back to you on that one. <laughs> Just your microphone, Rachel, sorry. Yes, it has. It has come up in one of the many hats that I wear in the um, Department of Health, uh, both with my nursing role, and it has come up in conversation on the Women's Health Task Force, um, among many other key nursing roles in terms of supporting education and awareness of important information and education on the really kind of more complex topics as well. So again, what I would encourage people to do is to remember we're still formulating our targets and tasks for 2021. So please um, engage with us and put your feedback in because these are really, really important issues and that's a great idea. Rachel, can I ask you another one that came in? Sorry, sorry. And then sure. <laughs> it's okay. No, I'm uh, delighted. I'm delighted. Uh, something else that's come up amongst my friends quite a bit is uh, smears and having your, you know, your smear test done. In my 20s, when I was, I moved here when I was 24, but it would have been an annual thing in, in Canada. I know it was annual here for a while and then it's extended out to three years, but is that when you reach a certain age? And also the amount of conversations I had with female friends when I first moved here that had gotten to the age of uh, 28, 29, 30, that hadn't had one, I was really surprised about. And again, that's not putting blame on the patients at all. That's just having more open conversations about it. And yes, it's unpleasant, but how necessary it is. But just the idea of moving away from a yearly smear was the question, why, why has that been happening? Yeah, well, look, our, our programs are um, kind of evolving and we've had a lot of focus on our uh, cervical check campaigns and screening programs, uh, particularly over the last two years. So the program itself is done in line with best international evidence. We have a highly accredited um, system and obviously it has a lot of focus on it. So the time frame is still within international best practice limits. Um, and obviously uh, it's a screening program. So it's, it's 
you know, it's not an exact, di it's not diagnostic, it's not exact, but it is important. But just to reassure that the timelines and timeframes for screening are still well within international safe limits um, and we have a really, really good screening programme. So the message to take away is, you know, to continue going, make sure you get, when you get your card, your card or your call, that you go um, and you make your appointment for your smear test. That's really, really important in terms of our health. Perfect. Rachel, thank you so much. Um, Jean, if I could come to you now, you spoke yep. about, um, you know, books and you mentioned conversations with friends and normalizing um, uh, endo with with the fact that, you know, there could be characters that people can identify with. And I love that idea of, you know, um, comforting people by reading about certain conditions. Would you, you know, what age do you think, and are there books for younger children to look at? I know I might be springing that on you, um, but do you have an awareness of literature for younger women uh, or moms to give to their children as well? Um, well, I'm a fan of romance novels. That's where I kind of tend to see this stuff represented, but there are lots of YA books out there um, looking at various different issues. I don't know if there's any specifically looking at endometriosis, but um, you will go on Goodreads and you'll find a list of YA novels tackling controversial health subjects. And a lot of those authors, they're under a spotlight and their publishers are involved. So you're not going to see um, like an anti-vaxxer YA book come out, you know, from um, HarperCollins or something. Um, and now a lot of the books might be about terminal illnesses and stuff like that, um, which can be quite depressing. Um, but, you know, that can provide comfort for people as well if they're grieving or something like that. But um, I think that um, there probably is a gap in the market for an endometriosis um, book, but I haven't um, heard of one in the YA market. But um, I'm excited now that the conversation with friends is being made into a TV series and it's going to hopefully if it's as big as normal people and I hope they have a good consultant consulting with them on it um, about the symptoms and stuff because that would be like that's going to be a huge international audience on a piece of art where the heroine has endometriosis so like Sally Rooney and Neil Eberson and the people involved they're just telling a story but they're telling a story that has a huge impact because RT actually Fair City had endometriosis a plot line and I was looking up what happened to the character and she ended up getting killed in it she was like stabbed by somebody in a plot line later on um some kind of murder thing so I didn't put that in my slides because I was like it's a bit too on the nose um, <laughs> I loved how you made that point about how reading, even in a fictional scenario, that it can create comfort for people as well. Uh, just for people joining us, it's bias slash women's slash health dot com. This is going to stay live for a little while. And we mentioned earlier that menti dot com is open for a week for people to make their suggestions um, there as well. Um, Kleena as well with the work that you guys do, and it's kind of tied in with what I was just asking Jean, but. You know, should we be talking to our kids very, very young about, you know, about our reproductive lives as women, but also, you know, um, I know that I, when I tell my friends, that was my dad that told me about my period, everyone was like, what? Oh my God. <laughs> but like that, you know, how, do you have advice on parents and how, what age they should start directing their conversations in this format towards their children and supporting um, them? Yeah, I suppose, I guess what we're doing in the Women's Council is, yeah, we are trying to open up these conversations. I think we've been doing work around the sex education program in schools, and we're a membership organization in the Women's Council. So we'd have kind of uh, members from the youth sector and uh, members from the education sector, and there may be more, much more, act they'd be able to give you the exact age range and that kind of discussion. But I suppose what we've been trying to do at a policy level is to try and ensure that our sex education in Ireland um, is actually is meeting us where we're at, I suppose, as a society in terms of being open about these issues. We've had, you know, it's the case at the moment that it, depending on what school you're in, you receive different sex education at different ages and so on. And I suppose there was actually a really good report done this week. Um, it was released by the ESRI for the HSE Sexual Health and Crisis Pregnancy Programme. And it's talking about these exact issues of when exactly do young people tend to hear about particular uh, issues around sex education, around reproductive health and so on. And it's providing kind of recommendations about how we can make sure that that's something that all children, all young people have access to. And um, so I think, yeah, we, we have to do something, I suppose, as a, as a system and as adults to make sure that young people have places to go and where they can have these conversations. Actually, before we wrap this morning, Kleena, will you give out your points of contact again for women who want to find, or people, sorry, listening to us today want to find out more information about what you guys do? Yeah, so 
And you can visit our website, which is www.nwci.ie. And we're also on, we're active on Twitter and Instagram using the Women's Council, so at NWCI. Um, and as, like there's a lot of information there at the moment, I suppose, I'd just like to highlight during COVID, we have a hub on our website, it's called Women in COVID, and it's providing supports around health, around mental health, um, but also around economic issues, around issues women are experiencing around violence. And um, so we think that's a good resource. It's pointing women to uh, supports that are out for them, that are there for them at the moment. And Jean, I want to ask you the same thing, just to give out your points of contact for uh, women, you know, w living with the condition in Ireland as well. Your mic again, you're on mute there. <laughs> Um, so endometriosis.e is the website and you can join as a member if you want for access to forums and stuff and we're on all the social media. We're very active on Instagram in particular, we're on Facebook and we're on Twitter and we have a YouTube channel but it's been underutilised now um, but hopefully with the pandemic um, continuing and we'll be able to do a video event or two in the next couple of months on that. Brilliant, thank you very much. There's so many comments to, um, to get through. I completely agree with the researcher that experts by experience, i.e. women should be shaping the service developments required. Well done, uh, Tina with the National Women Council of Ireland. Um, there's so many lovely ones coming in and I appreciate all of your time this morning. It's been really informative, it's been incredible. Um, Michael, if I could ask you just before we wrap as well, if people are concerned about their own health and whether they have conditions that you've spoken about this morning, I suppose you're going to advise them first to go to their GP, but is there any other advice you could give them? It's difficult to say, I suppose, uh, without knowing the specifics of a case, but in general, if, if somebody has very irregular or absent periods, that's a red flag and they should go and speak to their GP. And if the GP feels that onward referral to a, a specialist of whatever kind is is mandated at that point, then they, they'll be placed to do that. But um, we we do lots of work, GP study days and things like that. And, and primary care is a really important tool now in, in disseminating understanding about these issues. So I don't want people to be terrified by that um, recent publication, but it's just it is a warning sign periods very irregular or absent, please do go to your GP. Thank you very much. And Rachel, will you give out the information uh, one more time for the task force and how people can get in touch there as well, please? Sure, be delighted to. So I suppose just to remind people that there will be a number of town hall events that we will be um, going nationwide with in the coming uh, weeks and months. So keep an ear out for those. And um, that will be information that I've shared with you today and the ongoing updates from the task force. Um, on the Department of Health website, then you will uh, see the link to the Women's Health Task Force and I will ask the RCSI to share the details of the web page and the email address that people can use to contact us on an ongoing basis. And then, of course, menti.com uh, and the code using your um, access to that from present from being here today. Um, and that's open for another week. I think it's amazing. I think that's been the real light bulb moment for me from all of this is knowing that that's available to us as well. Um, Laura, thank you so much as well for your time. I think, you know, in order, and everybody says this, in order for us to learn uh, how to go forward and make improvements, we need to know the history of, of our situation as well. Yeah, definitely. I think it's so important because it shows, you know, how yeah, how ideas around women's health are really shaped by um, society and, um, you know, and how much has really remained the same in how women are, women's health issues are, are uh, addressed, you know. Um, so hopefully things things are starting to change. But yeah, if anyone is interested in, in learning more about the history, I can put my details in, in the box there um, and yeah, happy to discuss further. Thank you uh, so much to everybody this morning. Of course, it's all part of Science Week, Rotunda RCSI Research um, Development and the HRB Mother and Baby Clinical Trials Network as well. It's been absolutely amazing to be part of it all. So thank you so much to Dr. Laura Kelly, to Jean Sutton, to Dr. Michael O'Reilly, to Kleena Lochnan as well as to Dr. Kleena, sorry, and to Rachel Kenna as well. I'm not sure if Emer wants to jump on to say anything to, um, final wrap but thank you and I found it really fascinating and I'm sure absolutely everybody else who's joined us this morning has taken so much away from it as well. Yeah I'll just wrap up by giving out the URL again so it's bias-womens-health.com and you can 
find all of our resources at hashtag bias women's health um, on Twitter. So follow along there for the rest of the week, I suppose. Science Week finishes up on the 15th. So thanks everyone for joining and thank you to all of our guests and Alison, you were absolutely phenomenal. So hopefully everyone enjoyed. There will be a recording of this. We're hoping to put it up on our YouTube channel and hopefully on the website as well. So just follow along to the hashtag to find out where to find all of that, but uh, we'll leave it there. So thanks very much, everyone.